I am very pleased to be here, although I gave a seminar here like uh, five years ago, I would say, the first time when we start uh, uh, collaborations. And uh, how will I formulate my talk uh, today? You know, I want you to realize this uh, connection between uh, basic research and development uh, of any product, so-called product. So when you apply today to any uh, grants, and I was uh, a member of ERC Advanced Panel Life Sciences uh, Panel LS7 for 10 years, and I was chairing it for four years, and I have seen thousands and thousands of uh, so-called basic applications, and normally 9 to 10 percent pass. But uh, I would like to show you where is the level of these grants as compared to what is more and more requested by other agencies in Europe and elsewhere. You have to have more advanced approach towards some benefits of the people of Europe or people of America or any people worldwide. Nobody is giving you any money to anyhow satisfy your curiosity or to your academic career. So that type of funding uh, does not exist anymore, except in ERC panels. And I was deeply against that because my panel was called medical therapy development. And I'll tell you why it is not possible to develop a medical therapy if you start from scratches and apply for a grant, because that's not possible. And that is because people who are defining the conditions, they do not understand the process completely. And I thought today of showing you on some examples how the process looks like and why I use my experience in basic research and then collaborations with other companies to finally make our own product, which is now in uh, uh, phase three clinical studies, uh, which will start probably in a month or two. Yeah, so let me lead you through that simply basic science in very high impact journals, you know, fantastic, you know, and then you cannot move forward because you don't know how, or you don't want to deal with a pharmaceutical industry or other type of industry immediately. You know, when we started to work on uh, bone morphogenetic uh, proteins, you know, this was uh, my first in situ hybridization, which I did uh, with a group from Amsterdam. You probably know Marco Helder. Marco Helder is very good in stem cells and specialized in stem cells now, but he was my postdoctoral fellow when I was leading a laboratory in the uh, beginning of 90s at uh, NIH in the bone branch. It was a bone section and Marco Helder from Elizabeth Berger was sent to me and that is the in situ first we did. And then we start to realize that BMPs have pleiotropic functions because they are distributed in many, many organs, you know, and uh, as you can see, choroid plexus in the brain, then bones, here you have skeletal, I mean, uh, head bones, and here is the heart. No, here's the kidney, kidney is loaded, and intestine is loaded. And this was uh, BMP7 at that time. And, uh, you know, if you follow the field of BMPs, you see that there are really uh, very important in the development in and in uh, post-developmental life on all uh, developmental envelopes. And what is here uh, more increased in letters, you know, these are the organs we have really studied, but not because we are experts for teeth or we are experts for pancreas or diabetes, we were looking for common denominators on the function of BMPs 
as a regenerative molecules in these organs. So we have publications uh, in liver and then also in digestive tube, in diabetes, uh, the majority is in skeleton because that's my primary interest, then in kidney and recently excellent collaboration with uh, Serena here uh, resulted in a very nice uh, publication and Andrea is here, yeah, and then two or three collaborated also with leading people. So if you are not an expert in that field, but you know what the molecules are doing, then you come to Serena because she knows molecular cardiology and she has all the equipment. And then it's, it's very simple to collaborate on a highest level, you know. So if you don't know exactly diabetes, then you go where people do diabetes. And that is the logical uh, way how you make alliances and collaborations, you know. You don't explore by yourself because you are losing and wasting your life, you know. Not time, you are wasting your life. Because for a product development, you need 12 years. And the question is, uh, when are you going to start? Because you may fail. So if you fail at the end, you wasted your life, you wasted your career. So how are you going to make this decision when it's time to start to think of higher uh, de developmental levels. So, you know, we collected uh, all of the best uh, papers published in, uh, in the field and invited the best people to, to talk, uh, to write about the BMPs. You know, these are three books. And then this is the last one, uh, which is published in 1917. It's also contributed, you know, by the leaders, uh, leaders in the field. And we will have a conference on BMPs in Dubrovnik uh, this year in October. Now, the question which I am going to ask is how to commercialize uh, any discovery and what kind of knowledge and skills you have to have if you want to go forward. And uh, I will lead you through a couple of examples, but before that, I want to show you just uh, uh, where is BMP6. You know, BMP6 is here. Here is the family 567. And this is a tree of identity, you know, so and based on the sequence, you know, and very close is Drosophila 60A and Drosophila DPP, you know, and then BMP2 and 4, BMP3 is distant, far away. You know, and the function of some of them are not uh, really fully understand. So I worked on uh, discovery of BMP five, six, and seven with Herman Opperman, who is now working as a biotechnology leader in uh, Zagreb in our laboratory, uh, making uh, a recombinant BMP six. Uh, then I worked with uh, GDF five, six, and seven in this discovery because we pu published similarly the paper in 1994 together with the University of, uh, of Hopkins and they call it uh, gross differentiation factor 5, 6 and 7 and we called it cartilage derived morphogenetic protein 1, 2 and 3. But it was a horrible time, you know, because they published this in uh, in a march in nature, you know, and we have everything done. But they did it by, by uh, molecular techniques and molecular search, and we purified it from cartilage. We found it in cartilage, you know, so it's a absolutely 100% different approach. And what can we do? If it's not published in the same year, you lose the discovery, you know? So what did we do? At that time, Vincent Haskell, who was, the, uh, who was uh, associate director of General Biological Chemistry, he was in the same institute at NIH where we were as well. And then we came to him and said, Vince, look, uh, we have everything, the full discovery, fantastic paper, you know, what can we do? We need a rapid processing by, by General Biological Chemistry. That's all to get it in the same year. And it came out in November, you know, and it's a highly, highly cited paper and so on. But terminologically, you know, people call it uh, GDF 5, 6, and 7, although we gave different names, but these are the same molecules. 
And now they are also called BMP 14, 13, and 12. So it's all opposite. The bigger BMP is here, the lower is here. GDF 5 is BMP 14, you know, uh, terminologically. And then you see Tiger Beta family is here. And uh, when you call it Tiger Beta super family, it's probably not right because you can find the BMP homologs in nematodes and very early. And TG beta, the first time you find a gene in drosophila, but BMP-like genes are in much earlier in the development. So it would have been BMP superfamily, but the TG beta was published first by Anita Roberts and Michael Sporn in 1986 and the uh, 1986 and the BMPs were published in 1988, you know, so it was a difference. So therefore they are called TG beta super family instead of uh, BMP family. And now, you know, over years you have a really uh, a robust genetic evidence. Uh, what are they doing by different molecular techniques? I want to show you, for instance, what happens if you knock out BMP5. Then you have a mouse uh, with lacking oracles, you know, you don't have an oracle. And you see people, you know, in the street without oracles. So, you know, they have a mutation in BMP5. Nothing else. Everything else is fine. Why? Because other BMPs substitute one for each other at the location they are. So, if they are at the same location, two or three BMPs, for a safety reason, to prevent lethality, then one BMP can compensate for another. But not at all sites, because at some sites there are only single members expressed. So, for instance, you see, if you knock out BMP7, then the mouse has no eyes, it is blind. And it's connected by PAC6 uh, function, which cannot function without BMP6. BMP7. And then also, you see, you don't have uh, kidneys develop because the kidneys start to develop this a wild type, and this is a knockout. They develop normally to stage uh, 11 and 12, day 11, 12 of development, and then the mesenheim vanishes. It's not developed. Why? Because the BMP7 is the only one expressed in the mesenheim, and mesenheim of the kidney does not develop with any structure, so the animals die in 24 hours of uremia, you know. So it's very, uh, very much uh, uh, challenging, you know, what I would now target as a potential therapeutic focus. And now, you know, if you uh, knock out GDF5, as we call it, cartilage-derived morphogenetic protein 1, and it's really something to do with the cartilage, you know, this is the phenotype. You know, this is how people look when they don't have CDMP5. The axial skeleton is fully maintained, but the peripheral skeleton is missing. So they have a chondral dysplasia, you know, which is uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Brazil and uh, in the forest. You know, the majority of these people live there. And uh, that, that was a significant discovery at that time. You know, now when you ask uh, how much of these products or any product from the TG Beta Super family reach some type of techno technology readiness level. And this TRL phrase is critically important for submitting your grants because the reviewers and the guidelines will ask you what is the level of your development of your discovery, you know, where are you by TRL? And that is technology readiness level. And technology readiness level means that you need different stages to come to an end of your product. You know, and the product can be technical or the product can be pharmaceutical. You always have nine stages, but you call them differently, you know, and uh, for fun, uh, I show you this slide here now, you know, from idea to the pathway explained via technology readiness level, you know, ERC advanced grant are technology level zero. So I'm dreaming, you know, I have a fantastic idea. I don't have preliminary results, but it will work, you know, and you have five years. 
And that is what the panel is receiving from BRC. People have fantastic ideas, you know, but they have no, no proof. So if you are a dreamer, then apply for advanced uh, ERC grant. However, if you move forward and then you are still at the laboratory, rodent level, then you are between TRL 1 and 4. If you move forward now and introduce other techniques, I'll show you in the development of a drug, then you are out of the comfort zone because the number of statistical analysis is not five anymore. You know, it becomes 20 or more. So you have to do significant bigger experiments and you have to repeat them and you have to write reports which are classical pharmacological reports these are not scientific papers so your life is changed and you are somehow outside of your comfort zone you know so you have to do it differently your experiments the designs are different and so on because there are required by guidelines from regulatory agencies and finally, when you come to be a true innovator, that means that your dream works. Then you are at technology readiness level six, nine, six to nine. And that means uh, you are really an innovator. And from a pharmacological point of view, if you develop a drug, you know, these are steps to, to develop a, pharma, a pharmaceutical product. Look, uh, this is uh, a dreamer is not here, you know, at level one, two, three, and four, you are still before you have to go to GLP. And then at level six, seven, eight, and nine, you have to go to GMP. You know, already here, you have a lot of uh, other safety, uh, pharmacodynamics, you know, and other methods you have to apply to your uh, molecule, and uh, the target and then you start to do really formulations and uh, preparation for clinical studies and then you go to phase one and two clinical study this is phase two phase three and then finally preparation for marketing and uh, distribution and that can take you know eight years in a very developed uh, company it took only short period of time to make vaccines. That is the first time in the history of medicine. Then the vaccines, because of pandemia, were done in a very short period of time. So you understand what was missed, you know, sure, because they jumped through these stages in, in a minute, you know, so they were not all needed experiments done because you cannot do it in, uh, in six months, you know, it's, it's impossible. So now, uh, what, need, what you need to do to, to come from TRL uh, 1 or, or 0 and 1 to the higher level? You know, scientific education uh, is much uh, more complex than before. In academia, TRL development is uh, rarely possible beyond the level TRL 4. Then to recognize uh, patentable discoveries, you have to have some education and skills because not everything you see and believe it's patentable is really patentable. And then, you know, knowledge about patenting is a requirement in scientific institutions these days. But the question is, and I'll show you why, what is the right time when you really file a patent? Because if you file a patent at TRL 1, 2, 3, which is a possibility, and then somebody will license it, you know, the patent comes out in 20 years if you are not in clinics. And then if you are in clinics, you have another five years. So you have in total 20 or 25 years. But if you need 12 to 15 years for the development, then for exploitation, you have only uh, five to 10 years left, which if you invest uh, one, two or three billion dollars, you are not enough time to get your money back. So investors are very picky, you know, whether they will take it or no, depending on how much time they have uh, for, for exploring, uh, you know, the finding. So let's come, you know, to ERC grants. 
often they are submitted without any preliminary results. And when I was leading a panel, I was trying always to reject uh, projects which are a dream. You know, if you don't have any preliminary results, it's very difficult to believe that you will succeed. However, if you have a medical therapy you want to develop and you have nothing, you promise you will find uh, the targets, you know, then I can guarantee you, you will do nothing because five years to find targets and to come to uh, beginning of clinical studies is impossible. You know? So then the panel cannot be called uh, uh, development of novel therapies because that's stupid. You cannot develop novel therapies for, from an idea. You have to have uh, a reasonable uh, target which you have proven works at least. You know, this is TRL one or two. So, you know, funding agencies, uh, they require that you have some TRL for the benefit of European people. And uh, so your uh, application must be higher than zero than two. Then, you know, individual curiosity, as I told you, individual academic careers, people don't want to fund it anymore, the agencies. You know? Now, the great threat, uh, as you are uh, faced to, is also great consortia, uh, which are based on uh, scientific missions like CERN, professional guidelines, astronomy, you know, and so on, where you have 10,000 uh, co-authors, you know, and then you don't know who did what in the paper, but these people cannot get a job, believe me. If they apply to American uh, uh, Institute for a job, they will never get a job based on 5,000 co-authors in a paper. So we need some new research criteria and these uh, databases, you know, like guidelines and these papers from CERN, which are list of states giving the budget to CERN and all the people then coming from these states are in the paper. So my suggestion would be that the authors are states, you know, and the consortium is uh, the author, but the consortium is not individuals. It is states who paid CERN to do it. You know, and every experiment there is always done with few people, you know, so you don't need this 8,000. But the 8,000 are come there and then live there for a week and then go home, you know, and then you have 5,000 authors, technicians, everybody, everybody is an author who is sent by a specific country to go over there. You know, is that a scientific concept? No, this is a state consortium. So it should be under the title of the paper, Croatia, Italy, Germany, Iceland, England, you know, and no people. Why do you need the names of the 5,000 people? You know, they, they have no contribution at, at all. So the question I'm asking, is there a correlation between high impact journal and the TRL level? And I show you a couple of examples, uh, my own example, and then the recent paper with uh, Serena. And example one, you know, this is the paper I published when I came to NIH. You know, people normally need uh, five years, but I was lucky uh, working with the, the best people over there. I, I got the cover page of Cell, and these are some uh, vascular structures, you know, but you put epithelial cells here, including the osteoprogenitors. And why did we do it? Because the metagel, which was discovered by Hinda Kleiman. And Hinda Kleiman worked at that time at NIH and she discovered laminin. And uh, I worked with her for some time. And then it was called metagel basement membrane. And it was already uh, to become a product on the market for laboratory testing and use produced by Corning first, and then Merck took uh, distribution and so on. You know, and that was all why, why I needed that, because we looked uh, for binding of BMPs and TJ beta to different uh, mole molecules, you know. And then the strongest binding we find was to collagen type 4, and collagen type 4, you know, is in the basement membrane. And this metagel is done from the tumor, from the, uh, from the red Engelbert swamp tumor, and then extracted and made and, you know, 
produced as a product for laboratory testing, so it's validated, blah, blah, blah. And then, you, you know, I made a, a discovery which we could not publish anywhere because it was rejected in general cell biology, general biological chemistry, developmental biology. Then it came out in experimental cell research, IMPACT 355, but it came, this discovery led then the industry making chemicals for laboratories to the last stage of development. It made, uh, because we identified in that extracellular matrix components, growth factors. And people claim, I put cells and they make heart, you know? And then I say, okay, Sander, so for heart, you need only extracellular matrix. Yeah, sure. But you have tons of TG beta, EGF, IGF, you know, and everything else inside. So it's a soup of everything with extracellular matrix. So that was everybody was extremely surprised. They thought that Metrogel is uh, extracellular matrix. But we say caution should be done in interpretation of cellular activity related to extracellular matrix components because your response may be to growth factors and not to extracellular matrix. And okay, we published this and this was he, Hinda Kleiman. She discovered laminin and she was very famous in extracellular matrix field. Uh, Frank Leuten from Leuven, uh, he is uh, one of the best people in uh, history of uh, BMP and also regeneration of uh, articular joints. Anita Roberts, I told you, she discovered TJ Beta with Michael Sporn. And uh, Nadine Roche in her lab had the first TJ Beta method to measure TJ Beta worldwide. It was before you had all these other uh, different methods to measure TJ Beta in plasma or biological fluids. So we measured TJ Beta here. And Harry Reddy was a leader of uh, one of the groups in the, in the bone, uh, bone biology. And look now, I went to the web because of this lecture to find out that Metagel is uh, estimated to ship August 22. <laughs> so Metagel survived. But there is a Metagel with growth factor reduced because that paper made people, you know, to make Corning, you know, and distributed by Merck, a major gel which is without growth factors. And it's called, you know, basement membrane growth factor reduced. And it's based on that paper. So that paper is uh, cited in all papers, you know, ever when you talk about major gel or you talk about the exocellular matrix and we couldn't publish. You know? So if something is more applicable, you know, you cannot publish it easily because in a high impact journal, it was uh, rejected, but in exocellular, in, uh, uh, in general of uh, uh, the uh, cell matrix, you know, it was uh, taken and it was, uh, great discovery. And can you imagine it cost uh, just, uh, I don't know how many ml are inside, but it cost 612 uh, euros. And it's used worldwide, you know, everybody is using some major gel like substance to do some uh, vascular formation or checking how the cells behave in, in three dimensions and so on, you know. Okay, example number two, is the molecule we are working with, and we made it uh, to uh, TRL8 now. I tell you that story shortly, just to see how development of the product to which phase it goes. But we started here with mice I received from Elizabeth Robertson, and uh, Elizabeth Robertson and Bridget Hogan are very famous in genetics, you know, they have discovered many genes uh, at the beginning of the field of genetics and gen genomics. They were leading people. Elizabeth came from Oxford to Harvard and then back to Oxford again. And I received this uh, BMP6 knockout uh, mice from her laboratory. But the discovery was that BMP6 wild type and knockout animals is a very little difference the wild type sternum and the ribs this is a wild type and the knockout is a little bit delayed you know the ossification is a little bit delayed 
And that was all. No other finding. Look what you miss if you are not very precise or you don't know how to analyze your knockout phenotype. Look at this. We found in nine, 2009 that BMP6, uh, these animals have hemochromatosis. And then, you know, together with people from from Harvard, Jody Babbitt, who was also in our forum uh, talking about this, and Herbert Lin, uh, they already discovered in the laboratory that BMP6 was a major regulator of hepcidin. And hepcidin is a hormone produced by liver, a very short one, uh, being the major regulator of iron, entering from the gut into the system or staying then in different organs like liver and so on. You know, and this is the liver of this mouse look fully blue stained for iron and this is a wild type. So we found it that it's uh, loaded, you know, in plasma and it's loaded in organs. But the original papers say it's nothing. They are, they are healthy, you know. <laughs> but then on the on the cover, you know, we got this uh, we got this uh, paper on the cover. Now the question is: Are you going to proceed with the development? No, we we did not proceed with the development because we are not expert in this field, and it would be very difficult, you know. To you can only outsource uh, everything. And uh, but based on this uh, discovery, you know, uh, many uh, many drugs uh, regulating uh, BMP6 and regulating hepcidin are now in uh, TRL 5 to 8. And I expect that the BMP6 antibody uh, blocking, you know, binding to uh, co receptor and up regulating hepcidin would be very shortly on the market, you know. And hemochromatosis is a very, very horrible disease, you know, people suffer and there is no much therapy for an overload of iron in, in the body and uh, the position of iron in different organs make a lot of toxicity and damage in time. Okay, the example number three is our paper, which just came out. It is now in uh, uh, TRL 3, I would say, to 4, because we have done a lot of in, in vivo and a lot of in vitro experiments. So it's a big compilation of data. You know, it is not at, at early stage. And uh, just shortly about BMP1, which is the major focus, because I want to tell you that BMP1 is not really a BMP, because it was uh, wrongly disclosed as a BMP, but I'll show you these two science papers with wrong data. Although these papers are cited four, five, six thousand times, but they have wrong data inside. But that came out, uh, you know, this is the one uh, which we developed uh, uh, tools for research because we found it by proteomics uh, circulating uh, in the plasma of different uh, patients. And then we de developed, you know, here uh, with Serena, we published the heart. Uh, in the liver, we did something our, by ourselves with uh, specialists in liver in, uh, in Zagreb Hospital. And the first time it was published in uh, in Kidney, in General of America's uh, Society of Nephrology in 2011. But it's very difficult to progress in the field of kidney or in the field of liver cirrhosis because oh, it's horrible to have a clinical study at this po population. Very few companies ever succeeded with anything, you know, so you must really, uh, so it's much easier to, to, to work, uh, you know, with uh, Heart, because heart mainly can be focused on an acute indication, but these are very chronic indications, and these people are doing uh, horrible, you know, on dialysis and so on. So you don't want to touch this, especially if you are more in uh, academia located. And uh, you know, this in red are are uh, peptides we have characterized uh, by proteomics. 
and then uh, found this BMP13 and then went to discover other isoforms. But look historically, historically, BMPs uh, were uh, sequenced, was, was first published in 1988 in Science. And now I just uh, copied this from, from Science to show you that you have, you know, here is uh, BMP1, BMP2A, which is BMP4 now, this is BMP3, and this is control. And what is this? This is an implant. You do small pieces of bone, you put them under the skin, and then you uh, uh, bind BMP1, BMP4, BMP3, or MOC, or not. And you see here, it says that, uh, 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 so, uh, BM, that BMP1, you know, is making cartilage here. And when you uh, grade the activity, the activity of BMP1 at this ectopic site is 2 plus, 2 plus is maximum, and then plus 1, depending on the dose, and it's better even than a, a real BMP. And then even BMP3 was positive, which is not true. So, you know, absolutely everything is a mistake except of the sequence. The sequence is right, but the characterization of activity has nothing to do. But it took, look, a long time. It took eight years from Kessler in science, but this last author is uh, Daniel Greenspan. And Daniel Greenspan is an enzymologist in Wisconsin. He retired last year, but I was always in contact with him. So I sent him always to do the internal revision, except of our paper. But I sent him our paper, and he he rated it very high. You know? So he was very nice, and he gave a review of our paper once it was published. You know, and he said that he is very impressed and so on. But what you see here, you know, he tested the first time uh, uh, Daniel Greenspan, who is the last author, he tested BMP1 and showed that it has a PCP activity. And that means uh, this is the, he cuts off the pre-collagen propeptide, you know. So the pro part of the collagen is cut and then the collagen can be deposited as a fiber into the bone. So you have a problem with the osteogenesis imperfecta uh, without having this processing, you know, but it's not because of BMP1. But uh, this is the first uh, description that BMP1 is indeed having a PCP activity, meaning processing extracellular matrix. And it has an enzymatic uh, uh, activity in the first place. And since then, you have many, many papers, the whole field published what BMP1 is doing with extracellular matrix. That was the initial idea, you know, why we then made the protein. We developed then tools and the antibodies to be able to see whether you can prevent some fibrotic changes, you know, because there is nothing against fibrosis which is really uh, working. You have a long list of drugs, you know, but they are very... Uh, speculative, you know, and they are not very specific for really preventing uh, fibrosis directly. They work indirectly. And uh, as uh, e introduction in our paper, uh, Serena clearly wrote uh, that this is the first antibody ever in cardiology. You know, you have no antibodies to prevent uh, any process, you know, and uh, therefore this was a very important finding. And, you know, at uh, it was immediately uh, put into the 50 best papers from the translational clinical research uh, arena by editors of Nature Communications, which is a um, very high rating, you know, because they receive 55,000 papers a year, published only 7%. And then it's not that easy to come into 50 of all these uh, papers they they receive. Now, you know, uh, we have patents uh, where we protect uh, BMP1 and we protect it, you know, worldwide. And we have a very old patent uh, uh, which is still maintained, which says methods and composition for treating and diagnosing 
acute myocardial infarction, but that was before we started uh, the collaboration here. This was the uh, experiments we have done in uh, rats, you know, and then prevented with propanolol and uh, all of these indirect methods. We tried to ligate the artery in, uh, in the rats, but didn't have a good equipment, you know, and then uh, luckily we met and then uh, everything what we couldn't do was done uh, uh, by Serena, you know, and, uh, you know, this patent is still active, but it's delayed, it's not used, you know, so that is a problem. We could not have developed uh, uh, more than one product at a time, and we couldn't do the transfer, because if you do the transfer at this very early stage, you get more or less nothing, you know. So you have to develop at least something a little more to TRL 4 or 5 to make a deal with a pharmaceutical company, otherwise you are out of, out of business. So to show you how we develop BMP6 in our experiments, I will lead you now rapidly to these all levels we have passed uh, with these findings. So when you break the bone, you normally have a hematoma at the place. People know, and especially orthopedic surgeons, if you do not have the hematoma or during the surgery, you have to move it, it's an open fracture. If you miss that hematoma, it's very likely you will get a non-union. And non-union is a very difficult and disabling disease. So, you know, the blood clot is always formed. And now we have a really serendipitous finding. Why I use this term? because it's very unexpected. And uh, the first time in history of medicine, this term serendipitous was used uh, when Fleming uh, discovered penicillin, you know, when he saw that his bacteria are not growing, you know, for some reason di disappearing, he said, oh, this is serendipitous. You know? So the, this word is used from Fleming. You know? And for us, this was very strange because what did we find? You know, we found first that BMP6 is the only circulating BMP we could really clearly detect by proteomic analysis of plasma or in different uh, situations. And then we uh, started to produce it uh, on a large scale and shortly upscale that I'm now showing you what we did five years, I'm showing in one slide. You know, and uh, we start producing in 100 liters. This is already uh, TRL5, you know. So we had a lot of material then to do all these preclinical studies, including safety, toxicology, efficacy, everything in different animal models. You have guidelines which are very, very critically stringent. You have to follow them very closely. So we have done all of that. And luckily, I got the best uh, biotechnologist uh, in the world, not for GMP, but for R&D prior to uh, mass production. His name is Herman Opperman. He discovered uh, factor eight uh, in coagulation. He made a single chain antibody first uh, in in world. Then uh, he cloned BMP7, he made the cell line first and so on. So he is in Zagreb and he is running uh, uh, this uh, facility, and the facility was done uh, outside uh, academia. You know? So this is a, a, a startup company which is called uh, Genera Research, and uh, Herman Opperman is the CEO. And then the discovery, you know, after this was th this one. You know, we made uh, injected uh, uh, BMP6 into reds and then took out the blood and then in one case we left plasma in the other one we we left the serum so serum coagulates and the plasma doesn't coagulate so if you then check by western analysis you know where is your bmp wherever you have plasma it is still circulating you know but if you take a serum it's gone so where is it you know why is it gone and then everybody said, yeah, yeah, no, it went to the blood vessels. It was uh, bound by blood vessels. It disappears immediately. And I said, I, I don't trust you, you know, let's do this experiment. And this experiment simply suggested that autologous blood coagulum, we call it now ABC, 
can may be a carrier for BMP6. If this is true, then the blood coagulum is something spectacular unless you have it in your blood vessels and then you have thrombosis, you know, so you die. And then we realize that all organs regenerate from blood first, liver, rupture, everything has first a hematoma. And then from the hematoma, you know, everything starts to work out. Sometimes you can get some uh, regeneration back spontaneously, like in the liver, in the other organs, you get a scar at the end. But always you have the hematoma as the outcome. You know, so bone is also fighting against, uh, you know, non-union by making a hematoma. So then, you know, we did uh, numerous, numerous experiments to prove that when you add, you know, into the plasma uh, any, any amount of BMP6, 99.9% .9 goes into the coagulum and it was not those dependent. So we make the coagulum gel, which has to be homogeneous, cohesive, syringeable, injectable, malleable. If you cannot prove that, you cannot get a patent. And the patent fight for this was horrible because you cannot patent a part of the body. You cannot patent a gene. You cannot patent the protein anymore, nothing. It's impossible. So you can also not patent the use of blood, not possible. However, you can patent the formulation so we made a formulation which includes the coagulum so nobody else can use it. You know? So that's very important. And I'll show you that a little later. You know, and then first we went luckily very early to MHRA and MHRA is uh, British uh, EMA or British FDA, you know. And this is a regulatory agency and you go to them, you ask questions and then you put your position and then they answer you after that. And they say, yes, uh, coagulum is a very good uh, use and everything, but you have to show that it's robust and reproducible. So what happens if you are in a surgery ward and your blood will not coagulate? You know, oh, horrible, you know, the patient is in danger, so everything is prepared, you cannot make your product. So then, you know, we, we did uh, uh, testing in, uh, 1,200 human blood samples, you know, every morning at six o'clock, a team was in the hospital and then all the people waiting outside to give blood, you know, the nurse gave us one millimeter of uh, one ml of this 40 ml taken. And then over month and month, you know, people were testing coagulation with BMP, without BMP in 1,200 samples to prove that it's robust and reproducible. And then we did a tons of experiments, you know, release, uh, binding to different matrices, then in use stability. This was a requirement from Argus, Austrian regulatory agency. How long can you use it without degradation once you make the product? Can it stay one hour, two hours, three hours? And we proved 90 minutes, so they gave us hour and a half. Now we have extended to four hours, so you can take it uh, at time point zero of the surgery, and it is useful up to four hours because it doesn't undergo degradation. You know, so all of this is required and you have to really stringently define every, absolutely every step. And in the simple way, this is the novel biological drug, which has a lyophilized BMP6. We cannot lyophilize yet because it's very expensive. So we lyophilized in Bacinex. This is a GMP uh, facility in Switzerland. And they lyophilized BMP6 for us. You put it in the blood you have taken from the patient. Now we have closed the system, so we don't need to do it in a safety uh, protection. And then you let the coagulum form. You throw this above, you take the coagulum, you put it in between the bone ends, and that's all. Now, uh, I'll show you, we have added to this compression resistant matrix. A compression resistant matrix can be your own bone, it can be allograft from the bone bank, and it can be synthetic ceramics, which is produced by many, many companies. You mix it to, together and improve the biomechanical capa capability of your blood clot so you can, it is more rigid, it doesn't uh, uh, compress and so on. So um, it's very simple. And the major uh, uh, message is, 
whatever is not simple, it will never work. So don't get into something which is very complicated because you will never come to an end. Do simple, you know. But for simple, you have to have a discovery. And the discovery is that BMP6 binds 100% to the coagulum. And, you know, people normally use before for some growth factors and small molecules, some ingredients like PLGF, you know, like uh, uh, polyglycine, prolactic acid, you know, and then bovine collagen, you know, and then corals, you know, and all this bullshit. And if you put that in between the bone ends, you will inhibit bone formation because the blood cells and the, and the bone cells cannot go through, you know, so it's, it's a very uh, difficult problem. And then we apply to European Union and get uh, the first 6 million euros, you know, under the project name uh, Oslo Grow, funded by FP7 Health. You know, and many countries participated, but we were the coordinating institution, the University of Zagreb School of Medicine, and that was even before Croatia became a member of the EU. You know, then you have to pass to hold this preclinical. This is one of the uh, rabbit experiments with ALNA. You remove the ALNA and then in time, you know, you put your product in inside and then you see it's, it fully recovers and so on. So we have done tons of this. Then you have to compare it with the commercial device which contain BMP7 and bovine collagen and look after eight uh, weeks, uh, collagen is zero, commercial device is, uh, is behaving well, but we are done, you know, look, this is a continuity of the cortex and the medullary canal is already formed, so osteogrow uh, proved to be much better than existing, uh, uh, one of the existing devices, which is today off the market, it's not used anymore, which is a great advantage for us. And then, you know, we designed the drug, uh, packaging and labeling was done in uh, Belgium by a company called CSM. Today they are called Clinigen. And they did uh, labeling and packaging. It looks like easy. Yeah, sure, it's easy. They have to have every component and every component in the box must be separately tested and must have a European certificate, you know, Today, we have removed uh, uh, all the components from box B. It has only five components now. It has 11 here, but now it has five because we closed the system and make it more, more advanced, you know. So when the surgeon uh, or the pharmacist is opening the box B, it is fully labeled. Here is the lyophilized product. Here is the water of injection. So you dilute it in the water of injection and then you prepare it uh, with uh, this stuff inside. It has to be steadily prepared and therefore we close the system. So the first in human and the first time in man, this is American, this is uh, British, you know, uh, uh, TRL-6 uh, we did in Zagreb. The first patient with distal radius fracture, you know, with uh, uh, needed to go under surgery, uh, received uh, uh, the osteogro, and the rest of the patients were treated in Vienna in another study, which was TRL 67, which is called high tibial osteotomy, only in one site in Vienna. I'll show you just very shortly. Uh, this is uh, the paper phase one study on uh, radius. You see, when you compare uh, the radius treated in time, you see that even after five weeks, uh, it is already closed, the fracture line. And uh, we have a placebo, which is very rare in orthopedics because we have ingredients for uh, adding to the lyophilized BMP6. And now we can make a placebo, you know, because in coagulum, you don't know what is inside BMP or a placebo. You see, you have a delay. It closes at week nine and not at week five. And then if you use a uh, standard of care, it's also delayed. It's closed at week nine and not at week five. If you now uh, do the CT measurement of the resorption area, which is uh, post fracture, you know, and then you measure different uh, outcomes by three different observers very blindly, you see that there is a difference between week five and week nine in favor of uh, of the patients treated with uh, 
Uh, we call it, at, in, at the beginning, we call it autologous bone graft substitute because it's a substitute be, because you start with the coagulum and the BMP, so it's not the bone. So you substitute a bone from here, so you don't take your own bone, you take the substitute, and the substitute is your peripheral blood, which you transform into the bone. So therefore, we call this autologous bone graft substitute at the beginning, but then we change back to hostile growth, you know? And uh, as this is phase one, only the safety profile is important, not the efficacy, you know? But the safety was outstanding. There was no safety issues at all. And then in Vienna, the high tibial osteotomy, you know, it is completed and uh, reporting already done. You know, you make a correction of the varus deformity of the tibia, and then you move this triangle out, and then you put the osteo inside, and then you measure density in between, you know, these two bone ends now. And then you find that these treated patients after nine and 14 weeks, they have more density inside and they have more bone form. You know, this is placebo and this is uh, treated. Or if you have now individual patients, look how it looks like. This is a patient treated with, uh, uh, with the uh, osteogram. You know, the width is 12.5 millimeters, so it's very high. After six weeks, uh, you don't see much, but after 24 weeks, you see it's closing. And if you measure the bone density, you see it goes from 26 to 67. So it is a very, very nice uh, progression. In this specific patient, uh, you see also the same numbers. This is also Ostogro. Uh, the density goes from 60 to 200, you know. And then uh, inside, you see that the bone is uh, progressively formed. And then in this specific patient, uh, 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 the similar, you see that it is uh, closing, you know, and it's almost uh, almost close. And you can see it here, the gap is uh, very much uh, debridged even at the week uh, 14. And if you look now, x-rays of a uh, uh, series of patients after 20, uh, 24 weeks and two years, you see that uh, these patients treated are Almost, almost remodeled, but these are delayed, you know. Uh, what is the advantage? The advantage is that all these patients finally heal, but you want to prove, you know, that at this specific area in the bone, you have a, a stimulation of a metaphysical uh, growth and acceleration, which nobody has shown b before. So we call it now osteogro or osteogro A or osteogro C. Osteogro is uh, ABC or a blood coagulum plus BMP6. Uh, A is the same plus allograft and uh, the same plus ceramics and synthetic ceramics. So we have osteogro, osteogro A and osteogro C. So this is the family of products, how we call it now. It, it showed very safe in phase one and two. You know, you need very small amount. It's superior to whatever commercially exists. It significantly accelerates, accelerates bone regeneration and the carrier is homologous, which is very important. It can be injected and it will surely be much cheaper. You know, the first presentation we made in, in Oxford in 1916, I didn't want to uh, put the presentation before we filed the patent. And then we received all the patents and then we were fully protected, but not at the level one, two or three. You know, we were now at the level uh, seven when I uh, filed the patent and showed to the audience. You know, so nobody can get us because we are protected. And if you want to repeat it and steal it, you have to go through a new seven years. So you cannot come even close, you know. And uh, you know, then uh, we were lucky that the European uh, uh, Union and the European Parliament uh, used our uh, uh, grant and the progress of our funding, you know, as one of the five most successful European uh, grants. And then uh, we were present, uh, uh, called to present in 2018 in front of the European Parliament uh, 
two fundings. I'll show you the next funding. So as I said, we have Ostogro. Now you add bone allograft Ostogro A. You increase the biomechanical structure of the coagulum, which is already very condensed and compact. And then if you add synthetic ceramics, it's Ostogro C. You know, that is currently how we call it the Ostogro family of bone regenerative implants. Then this is the cover of one magazine. You know, we showed that we can also fuse the two segments of the spine, which is called the spinal fusion. And then we do it schematically of osteogro and osteogro A in this specific case of osteogro C. And then, you know, what, what we show, uh, this is a sheep that you can use the instruments uh, normally, which are used for arthrodesis of two segments, immobilizing two segments. And then we put our stuff, you know, aside, which is uh, coagulum or osteogro C. And look what happens. These are the instruments which is normally used in uh, clinics. This is uh, a sheep. These are transverse processes. This is one vertebra, the other vertebra. Here is the discus, which is eventually degenerated and the pain is coming out. But look uh, what happened be when you remove the instruments. Look, you have the bone. We form the bone. And what happens? These instruments get loose and then the pain comes back. But it cannot come back because we have another biological support, which is now preventing moving of the segments back, you know. So you have a double security. And if you macerate the specimen, it looks like this. You know, these implants are very well incorporated perfectly with, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, transfers of processes. And look how histology looks beautiful. This is an uh, undecalcified sample, which we sent to Jack Ratcliffe in Tennessee, you know, nobody in Europe can cut me five centimeters long, five microns uh, thick uh, uh, bone specimens. You know, this is five centimeters, this is uh, two, and uh, you know, look how it lo looks like, absolutely perfect. So that is what I show you, you know, the integration is fantastic, you see by micro CT and uh, the histology, it looks absolutely outstanding and nobody has ever succeeded in so-called posterolateral lateral fusion. And then we applied for another grant and we received the osteoprospine grant in the competition of, of 650 applications and only 4% were, public, uh, were uh, 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 funded. So we were very, very lucky, you know, in the horizon osteoprospine, which ends by the mid of uh, 2023. This is a design of phase two study, you know, many collaborators and they are all working for us uh, because we are developing the product, you know. And uh, let me just tell you where we are. We have recruited all 143 patients uh, uh, last uh, April. And now we have a 20 month follow up, which ends in uh, April 23. And then we'll have a full pledge uh, analysis to see uh, whether we have a successful PLF. It is uh, at these stages like this. And, you know, at the same time, we have a different approach also in the spine in China. And they have already recruited 60 patients and we made a transfer of technology to China. This is the first uh, European uh, transfer of any technology legally to China, which was not stolen and so on. So we have a contract and everything, you know, of transfer technology. They already have 60 patients also half a year ago already recruited and they're waiting for the outcome and they will eventually go into phase three with the same indication in uh, uh, half a year from now. Now we are starting phase two and three clinical study uh, to go into TRL seven and eight. And the indication is distal tibia and long bone non-unions. Phase two, 36 patients, we already have ethical approval. It is going in four centers in Austria, uh, Vienna, Salzburg, Innsbruck, and uh, Graz. And phase three is 148 patients, which will start in, uh, in the second quarter of 23. And, uh, you know, we were lucky we passed all the regulatory solvers without any problem. And this is a new Horizon 2127 for this indication which we applied. 
It's called also for union now, and these are the centers. And we now included uh, more uh, clinical sites, University of Leeds by Peter Giannoudis, who is very famous, then Charité in Berlin. And we have also a large orthopedic in, uh, in Munich, in Germany. So we have six uh, clinical sites for phase three clinical study. You know, so I think uh, if we get, and this grant is uh, for 8 million euros. If you get this 8 million euros, we will not be able to finalize the uh, TRL 9, but we will end up TRL 8 without diluting of the company which we founded. That means we have not taken so far any uh, partnership, no funding outside, because you know if you are at low TRL level, then you will get less money. If you are at a high TRL level, you will get $10 million for 10% of your company. If you are at TRL level five, you will get $5 million for 80% of your company. You know, so that's uh, how you should think about it. You know, so you never go too early and never file a patent too early. Because if you file a patent too early, you don't have this long exploitation time. And you may have hurdles to bring the product. So you go back and forth, you know. And uh, I am very positive that we will get this funding as well. It is two stage. The result of the first stage we'll find out in a April. But luckily, we got the patent, a new patent in March 21. This is American patent for the composition and formulation, which is ABC, coagulum, recombinant BMP6, but applicable to all BMPs and CRM, compression resistant matrix. And that could be whatever we want. Can be autologous bone, allograft, can be synthetic, ceramics, whatever. We got this formulation, nobody can touch this formulation from 21 to 41 plus five, which is on the market to 46. Every company now would come in and say, look, we have a time till 46, so we'll return any type of money and make any type of money. Now we have also covered uh, the synthetics ceramics uh, fully and com completely, you know, with the patent from uh, January 22. So now we are fully protected because the previous patent was issued in 2012. So it will be with application out in 32. So people say, look, if you have five, six years for exploitation, we don't want to fund this, you know. So now we made a big progress. And this should finally replace the use of your autologous bone graft from the patient's iliac crest, you know, especially in complex spinal surgery in long bone non units. What people do, they take your surgeons, they take your pelvic ring bone, or they take your fibula out, or they do a rhea, you know, they they rim your medullary canal of the femur and take out, uh, you know, cells, bone, and so on. Everything is painful. More than 20% of patients, they have complications. And more than 90% have pain in the pelvis and so on. And younger people, you know, after this surgery, they don't want to show in bikini anymore because they are not going to the beach anymore if they don't have a pelvic ring, you know. So it's horrible. So I think from the ethical point of view and from any point of view, if you can show that you do not need to use your uh, bone, own bone, to fill in the defects in the bone, then you have a huge product because millions of people are exposed to surgery, especially after trauma, this and that, you know, where you need to take patient's own bone to fill the gap in the limbs, you know. So that's the main, uh, you know, message. This is only a small team of uh, to whom I have to really uh, great appreciation because we have done that without a real pharmaceutical company. You know, this is almost impossible. And it has never happened in the history of medicine. I must say that at the end, because Mayo Clinic, Harvard, uh, they always file a patent, a TRL one to four, 
and then license it out to the pharmaceutical industry because they have no capacity to go on and not enough knowledge. So they license early. What they get in return is two to 3% of the sales profit at the end if it comes to market. Okay, they say that's fine. Harvard has an income of $350 million a year from such deals. You know, Mayo Clinic as well, Hopkins as well. In Europe, I don't know, uh, but I think it's less. You know, so this type of uh, licensing and transfer of technology at early stages uh, doesn't do, doesn't work so so well. You know, and here is Kevin Opperman, you know, who was mentioned. Uh, these are uh, uh, collaborators from URIS in Germany who are administratively perfect. This is the chief of our veterinary experiments. You know, this is Michaela who, who did, uh, she came from Glaxo, I hired her. This is Kuber Sampat, who is one of the founder with me of Genera Research. And he had the office of representation in US because if you don't pass FDA, forget it, no money. You will never do any money if you don't pass FDA because the majority of uh, human medicine profit is in is in America, you know, and these are many other people, but mainly, you know, uh, acknowledgement goes to European Commission, you know, to Osteogro, Osteoprospine, Osteo for Union and the Center of Excellence funding, which is in total more than between 20 and 25 million euros, which uh, led us to this level beyond some private in investing, you know. Thank you. I'm sorry. I was a little uh, old.